and now institute for one week. He's from now he's in Zurich. He defended his PhD at Cornell University. And uh, his uh, field of interest is application of uh, algebraic geometry to multiple calculations. So this maybe uh, you know that this is quite classical actually uh, region of loop calculations starting from you know from Landau considerations of uh, uh, one of the singularities of finite integrals. Okay, okay. So thanks a lot for your invitation to this very nice institute, and I'm glad uh, to talk about some basics about uh, the recent progress in the multi-loop uh, uh, integral reduction. So what kind of integral I'm going to talk about? So the integral I'm, I'm going to say is basically the Feynman integrals coming from. Uh, high energy physics, especially the two loop or three loop, higher loop ones. So uh, I just draw some graph like this. I just use a line. Okay, so this one just mean I just mean the topology of the graph. Okay, so this line could be a fermionic line. It could be a gluon line, but just any kind of line. Okay, so the thing is uh, we have a lot of objects uh, like this in high energy physics. Okay, so why this kind of multi-loop uh, uh, integrals are quite important? So there are several reasons. Now, one thing obvious is is uh, quite uh, important for the LHC precision. So, uh, you know, for LHC, because okay, so LHC really start from uh, proton proton collision. So, in this case, okay, uh, in this energy regime of LHC, you can see actually uh, the processes are dominated um, by QCD. But you know QCT, okay, also for high energy QCT is uh, put a bit you, but uh, the coupling constant for QCT, okay, suppose you talk about uh, the Z uh, mass, as, as this mass scale, okay, is actually, is not something that small. So if you really try to get some precise theoretical prediction, okay, uh, you try to compare the theoretical results with the LHC experimental results. Then in many cases, you have to calculate the scattering amplitudes okay, for QCD or for standard model, or some kind of beyond standard model. Not just uh, to the tree level or one loop level, you need a two loop level. And in some cases, you, you even need a three loop order. So, so that's the physical reason so this kind of thing are important. <laughs> okay. So that also sounds... Please, uh, uh, speak a little bit louder. Okay, sorry, okay. sorry, okay. Okay, so secondly, this kind of uh, multi-loop uh, integrals uh, are also important uh, for some formal study of theoretical physics. Okay, so for, for gauge theory, for supersymmetric Yamil theory and for supergravity. Okay. And, uh, could you call uh, at least a few examples where multi-loop uh, calculations uh, are important for LHC? Oh, yes, uh, for example, this kind of uh, gluon, gluon fusion. So gluon fusion to Higgs, you need this kind of three-loop contribution to the process, not just the three or one-loop or two-loop. And uh, you suppose that uh, analysis of information uh, is restricted only due to unknown multi-loop calculations? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Okay. Okay. 
I think, uh, well, of course, this kind of alpha s is around 0.1 is uh, a very important reason, but I guess there could be other reasons because uh, you could say for some of the process, okay, if you consider some kind of uh, helicity violating process, okay, if you say I have uh, some two incoming gluons like uh, uh, plus plus, if all outgoing gluons are also like uh, uh, plus plus, so this one is uh, highly uh, helicity violating. So if you consider some lower order diagrams, okay, if you consider tree diagram, actually it's zero. So if you uh, think that in this case, the leading order actually is one loop. Then if you try to get uh, really good correction, you need a two loop. So that's uh, one of the things you need for QCD. Why is a two loop or high loop important? But the question probably was not about this, but about whether there are other sources of uncertainty. Uh, uh, which is apart from, from the uncertainty which comes from applying perturbation theory in finite order. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, if you know this, uh, like uh, partition uh, PDFs. Uh, yeah, PDFs, yeah. So uh, the, the precision of PDFs, which is is it sufficient to, to, to trace this three loop effect, for example, this three loop effect? Uh, three loop effect. Do you know this? I'm, I'm not expert on this kind of PDF distribution function. Uh, because uh, since you said that uh, three loop uh, level is still uh, important for the season, yes. this probably means that. Uh, Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I will consider this kind of thing later. Okay, thanks for comments. Uh, okay, so there's also some formal reasons so people are interested in, in this kind of multi loop uh, integrals or multi loop amplitudes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, one thing, okay, which is uh, quite quite interesting is uh, some formal development called the uh, BCJ relation. So, roughly speaking, this one is. Uh, Times uh, young males. So sometimes uh, people are quite interested in the gravity uh, amplitudes, or, or, well, in general, not this kind of Einstein gravity, but a super gravity. So one of the fundamental questions is uh, if this, uh, for example, the maximal supersymmetric gravity theory, the NX8 supergravity theory, is uh, uh, finite or not, okay, is, uh, is eventually renormalizable or not. So uh, in this case, if you really try to calculate this kind of uh, uh, like a supergravity amplitudes to maybe to two loop level. Okay. Of course, it's a quite quite interesting question, but uh, you know it's very difficult. But in this case, you can consider some kind of a, a double copy structure is called the BCG relation. So that means, uh, roughly speaking, the integrand. So you can consider the Feynman diagram for supergravity. So the integrand of supergravity actually is a double copy of Young Mills times Young Mills. So if you consider this gravity is n equals eight. Then this one is roughly speaking the nx4 times the nx4, the two integrands uh, combined uh, together. Okay, so in that sense, if you really try to understand, okay, this nx8 uh, supergravity story, then we need uh, some kind of uh, uh, high loop. For example, this kind of Young Mills uh, uh, integrals and also this kind of Young Mills integrand, the color structure inside as a formal development. And of course, this, uh, if you consider this kind of N equals 4 uh, super Young Mills theory, okay, even in the probability level, it's quite, quite interesting that you wanted to consider some high loop integrals. Also, we have some kind of uh, Mathematical reasons why this kind of things can be interesting because, uh, uh, of course, okay, from um, 
two loop or three loop level, if you really try to calculate this kind of uh, Feynman integrals, uh, you will get uh, quite a complicated function. So the function is uh, some special functions. So in the simplest case, you have some poly, uh, this uh, poly logarithms, which is a generalization of the Euro poly logarithm. But in the more complicated case, you have elliptic polylog. So it's a, some elliptic version of it. So that case is not just uh, some pure theoretical thing because uh, uh, the understanding of uh, what kind of function you will get is uh, if you do some kind of uh, integrals which is quite massless then okay for example you just consider like a pure Yamiya theory no fermions just gluons so this kind of integrals can be quite quite simple just some point logarithm but if you consider something which is uh, very heavy, very massive, okay, you cannot ignore the mass, and I suppose uh, most of the properties are massive. Then for the two loop level, you will get a co quite complicated functions. You will get elliptic functions. So uh, this one, I think, uh, also attracts uh, uh, some mathematicians working on uh, this thing, this combination of a poly logarithm and the elliptic functions, and also uh, the structure of uh, modular forms, because uh, um, formally speaking, if you consider the unitarity cuts of this kind of very massive diagrams, you will get elliptic curve. Okay, but this kind of elliptic curve, so uh, they are actually rational elliptic curve. So that means if you put this mass scale and the minus unknown variables to integer or to rational numbers, the coefficients of elliptic curves are still, uh, uh, still just rational numbers. Okay, then this one is uh, a quite quite deep mathematical uh, direction related to, for example, number theory. Okay, the modular forms you can see. Okay, you have uh, some very simple expression for some physical uh, quantities, but that's coming from some kind of uh, like uh, the structure of this kind of rational elliptic curve and coming from some special subgroup of SL to Z. So that's a mathematical story inside it. Uh, another thing which is quite interesting is the differential equation. Yeah. So sometimes you know, okay, this kind of integration you will get quite a complicated functions, but you may don't want to do, do the integration, okay, just uh, by brutal force. Okay, you may consider the derivative of this kind of uh, multi-loop uh, integration, okay, towards some kind of kinematics variables. Like the simplest case, it's just the Mandelstam variables, and then you get a differential equation. So in many many cases, actually, it's uh, quite uh, uh, simpler to solve this kind of differential equation than to do the brute force calculation. So then that's a quite interesting question, like uh, for the generic two-loop diagram. So what kind of uh, differential equation you will get? Then in general, how do you simplify this kind of differential equation? For example, there are many, many different ways. One thing is uh, if uh, our world is a four-dimensional, okay, but the integration is defined in the d-dimension, then, okay, uh, actually, suppose you don't want the all the d-dimensional information, then given this kind of d-dimensional differential equation, then how do you do some kind of expansion to get uh, this uh, 4D information? Okay, so this uh, is uh, one way to study the simple form of the uh, differential equation. Another thing quite interesting is, of course, okay, uh, given, so this kind of differential equation is not just uh, uh, to solve one function, but maybe to solve a list of functions. Then somehow you can combine uh, this kind of, uh, this uh, system of differential equations into uh, 
one differential equation with a high degree, then you have a very complicated uh, differential operator. Then in this case, okay, then to study this kind of differential operator itself is quite interesting. For example, is this differential operator with a high degree factorizable or not? Is quite interesting question. So. Uh, I would say that this kind of multi-loop integrals, they are somehow, first, they are quite important for LHC physics, okay? And also, it's quite important for the formal development for theoretical physics, like especially for this kind of uh, perturbative uh, supergravity. And also, it's quite interesting for uh, mathematicians. So, I would say, okay, in recent years, we see a lot of uh, research projects about the different aspects of the multi-loop integrals. And uh, I know that in the audience, okay, uh, some of you are really experts on this uh, direction. So if I say anything wrong, just uh, please correct me. Or if you have uh, some suggestions, uh, okay, just uh, let me know. Okay, so. Status is still unknown, okay, because uh, people are doing that order by order. So uh, each order, so people, theorists will propose that it should be divergent because uh, just, uh, okay, you combine this kind of uh, uh, tensors which can appear in differential geometry. You uh, assume that eventually you'll get some kind of com quite complicated term, which is uh, some term breaks this kind of uh, uh, renormalization condition. But uh, then somehow you calculate, for example, the four point, uh, it's just, uh, it just uh, calculates the four point uh, amplitude and you really calculate the coefficients for this kind of bad terms. But they magically, if you sum over all the Feynman diagrams, cancel out. But this kind of thing, okay, uh, by, for example, like a Professor Sui Burn, he will say that, uh, of course, it's coming from the maximal uh, supersymmetry, but it's also coming from some hidden identities. He didn't know where it's coming from. So, three loop, we can prove that there's no such kind of bad divergent term. And the four loop, okay, so he spent many years, he proved that there's no such term. Uh, five loop, okay, so this research is somehow getting stuck because five loop, uh, you have a huge number of diagrams, and uh, this BCG relation. Actually, so far for four points still doesn't the work. There's some problem with that. But of course, this one is uh, at the perturbative research, so you can disprove. Okay, some if some people say like a file loop, there should be a quite bad term, and maybe eventually you clean up all the computation, you can disprove it. But you can never prove. Okay, just by perturbation, yes, it eventually should be okay non-divergent. Okay, so there's some struggle here. May I ask you about classical limit of the, of the supergravity? Yes. Is there some uh, an Einstein equation or something different? It's very different. It's uh, supergravity. So it's um, because, for yeah, example, the classical uh, limit. Let's forget about uh, loops uh, and uh, loops. Okay. Uh, okay. You uh, have some Lagrangian and consider uh, classical limit. Yeah. What do you will obtain? Oh uh, well, that's a very that's a very good question. So in this case, okay. Uh, so besides, uh, so besides this kind of uh, gravity, huh? Okay, you will have a gravitino. So this gravitino introduction. In Einstein equations, there is no any gravitino at all. No gravitina, no quantum rotation. Okay, there's so no you any kind of quantum. Classical content. equation, and you have only Riemann tensor and nothing more. Mm. Due to, uh, so, what is the classical limit of this supergravity? Uh, that, that's something I'm not so familiar, but uh, well, I heard that in this case you cannot just assume, okay, you always have uh, this kind of uh, attraction force between two massive particles. In some cases, some configurations, you can even have a repulsive force between uh, two massive objects. And it depends on what? What is the Mm. There are just another matter of fields, it's gravity plus uh, uh, another fields, H fields, uh, symmetric tensor fields, and so on. It's all matter. So you cannot uh, set uh, by hand uh, a tensor of uh, energy, uh, energy uh, uh, momenta uh, to be equal to zero? Of course, in this theory, you just have another bosonic fields. 
cross gravity. Einstein gravity. Cross only with some corrections. So we basically So there is some additional independent forces of the same order as uh, gravity, and they may be stronger than. Uh, yeah, like just like, like for example, you have photons, you, uh, and then you have electromagnetic uh, strength, right? Uh, but, have, have, but, but, but in supersymmetric super super theory, you have more uh, uh, bosons or maybe... Uh, just, just yes, also. So you, you have yeah, more views. This is easy. Yes, yes, should be different. For each uh, boson... Uh. I, I, I would suggest that in this case, uh, well, besides okay, this ordinary gravity, okay, the gravity measured by okay, the distance, okay, classical limit, of the distance and the mass, but there are other kind of charges, okay, because in this case you have other particles, like the gravi uh, gravity photon, okay, so that one will somehow mediate uh, another kind of interaction between this kind of uh, new charges, not the ordinary electromagnetic. Charge, okay, so in this case, uh, then you have to somehow say, okay, is some, this kind of mass introduction, this interaction is strong, or this kind of new uh, interaction is stronger, okay, that's a question. Yes. Okay. So in this talk, I'm just talk about one particular direction. It's called the reduction of the integral. Uh, so we know it's not something that new. Okay. So, uh, well, just uh, from uh, maybe from this first class of uh, well, the first semester class of uh, calculus, you know, if you have very complicated integral, you don't want to do it by brute force. You can either change the variables, or you do some partial fraction. Or you do some kind of integration by parts. You first simplify the integrals and try to see what kind of answer you have. So uh, all these kind of uh, tricks can be used for very complicated integrals, like two-loop Feynman integrals. So uh, in general, okay, unfortunately, if, if you consider some real amplitudes, like the amplitudes from two-loop or like QCD standard model, these integrals are very complicated, and the reduction itself is also very complicated. So I will uh, go through this uh, topic somehow. So the objects I'm going to talk about is this. So this is a Feynman integral uh, in general. So uh, this denominates, okay, there are some quadratic functions uh, of the loop of momenta just uh, from Feynman propagate, okay. Uh, sometimes we could have a double the propagate, either just uh, directly from the diagram, okay, so from some kind of special kinds of Feynman rules, or it uh, could be, okay, from some kind of identities to rewrite the original integrals, okay, with some kind of double propagate integrals. And uh, upstairs, okay, if you talk about gauge theory, then in general this one, upstairs is not uh, the number one, but it's a huge tensor uh, of the loop of momenta, okay, here. So uh, sometimes we try to rewrite the whole thing like this, okay. We can formally 
rewrite is the one, okay. But then we request that this alpha index could be either positive or zero or negative. When that one is negative, then we just put it, remove it to the upstairs. That means we have the tensor. So uh, in general, I just write down something like this, but does not mean, okay, upstairs, this is always one because some of the index could be, could be negative. Okay, so uh, I just show one typical way of uh, uh, consider, for example, uh, if you try to get some cross section, you try to get some kind of scattered amplitude, what can you do? So, the first step may be just uh, uh, simply from finite rules. Okay. So, you just uh, sum over all the diagrams, so you get a quite, quite a big integral okay, with a complicated uh, numerator as a tensor. Or sometimes it's good to use unitarity. So unitarity means uh, you can really cut the loop diagram into something lower loop diagram or even tree diagram. So uh, somehow you can reconstruct uh, this integrand, okay, this Feynman integrand from the tree amplitudes. Okay, in many cases, uh, uh, actually it's a simple than direct Feynman approach, but not always. Okay, so especially you have a lot of massless particles, you know, a lot of gluons in the process. Uh, then actually, the uh, uh, unitarity method is very good. But suppose everything is massive, then unitarity itself, this procedure could be very complicated. So, uh, no matter what kind of uh, way you are using, you will get some integral like this. And actually not just one integral, you have a huge integral with uh, uh, different this kind of uh, alphas, positive, negative, and also this uh, in front, uh, all these kind of coefficients from your vertex. So uh, in this case, what can you do here? The first step may be So this is the integrand reduction. That's nothing special. It's just clean up this integrand. So the way to do it is, uh, OK, let's go back to this language. Suppose you have a This is the integrand. And you have some tensor like this. Then the good way is you try to simplify the tensor a little bit. The thing is you rewrite this n as uh, some delta okay so the way to do it is uh, okay you move a lot of terms into here the right the right side so make it proportional to one of the denominators then this term will cancel one of the term downstairs okay then you moved a lot of things into uh, the Feynman integrals with the fear propagate. Okay, and uh, in this way you can combine a lot of terms. So, uh, of course, you, you need to make sure that this uh, delta itself is much, much simpler uh, than the n here. So, uh, this kind of thing is integrand reduction. Okay, if you are lucky in some two loop cases, just by this very naive consideration, okay, uh, you remove some terms proportional to d, then upstairs cancel, uh, downstairs. Uh, you can remove maybe 90% of the terms uh, in your whole amplitudes. Okay, and also it uh, gives you uh, some hints on what kind of topology you have for the Feynman diagram. So, for example, if you do the the d-dimensional, okay, formats to epsilon is d-dimensional, okay, diagram. Suppose you have something very complicated, one of diagram, which is a hexagon. Okay, suppose you have uh, six particles interacting together. You may have a uh, hexagon. From, uh, the, from the Feynman rules. But you know that the integrand of this one is uh, something like this. Then there's a trick. The trick is coming from tensor uh, decomposition. Oh, 
sorry. Okay. So, so suppose that I, I, my convention is inside that is D dimension, but outside that's physical on shell for D. Okay. So if you have this diagram, you can find some uh, uh, tensor decomposition trick. Okay, rewrite the number one as some combination of the <coughs> denominates. Okay, these are some coefficients, so they are also uh, some polynomial function of the loop of momentum. So if you do this, you can find that although this one looks complicated, it has six uh, denominates, but uh, everything is proportional one of the denominators. So that means uh, this diagram, just by this naive identity, will be reduced to a simple topology. You'll get a pentagon box and triangles and the, uh, even lower diagrams. So you can to write this procedure. You can prove that if you have many many particle interactions, then uh, just with the format two epsilon, you should not have something more complicated than pentagon. Okay, they should be all reduced to be this kind of lower uh, Feynman integrals. Okay, so that's an important lesson you can learn from this kind of uh, integral reduction. But uh, this kind of thing, okay, you just uh, use a property, some tensors can be decomposed into uh, something proportional to denominator, and you just uh, cancel down, upstairs, downstairs. That's just some kind of algebraic simplification, okay? So the next step is, uh, okay, so after this step, you still have a huge number of integrals, but still many integrals are related, okay? They are not just related by this kind of integrand, uh, naive, relation, but they are actually related by, this is an integration by parts identities, okay. So if you just look at the integrand, you don't see the kind of relation, but if you can say, okay, if two uh, integrands just differ by total derivative, and this total derivative does not give you a surface term, then actually these two integrals are the same, that's called IBP identity. Also, sometimes you need to consider symmetry. You will get the so-called mass integrals, all this kind of uh, minimal sets. This one? Box, yes, sure, sure. Decomposition. Yes, there's some, there's some, some coefficients here, yes. 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 Ah, okay. okay. Ah, so your question is how uh, about the emergencies of water? Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay, so you get a minimal set of the integrals as a real is a linearly independent. Linearly independent means, okay, uh, you are consider this kind of linear relation with uh, simple coefficients. Simple means just some rational uh, functions of the dimension of the Mendelstam variables and also the mass, okay, this kind of simple parameters and simple functions. Now, of course, if you say you can use some special functions, then you can get whatever relation you can have, but uh, we restrict this linear relation to linear relation with simple coefficients of rational functions. So, I give you an example.
Okay, we have well, this kind of uh, double propagate diagram. Suppose everything is massless. That's a simplest example you have. Suppose we have this kind of process, uh, but you know if you have this kind of process, okay, uh, in general, this n here, okay, it could contain something, cancel uh, one of the denominators. So uh, anytime if you see this kind of diagram, you need to worry about it. You also uh, should consider some subtopology just by uh, pinching some of the legs. So for example, if you pinch uh, these two uh, here, you will get uh, something like this. Okay, it's still a two-level diagram. Okay, uh, has a field propagates. It's a subtopology of it, so it uh, may happen. So, uh, in reality, we really need to consider a huge class of diagrams. Even in the beginning, you just say, okay, I should have something like this. So you need to consider, okay, this kind of index alpha one uh, actually is uh, positive or zero. So these two are just some scalar products uh, added by hand because uh, these are not coming from Feynman propagates because this L1, this one does not talk with P4 here. So this one is artificial. I just put it uh, into the numerator as a numerator factor. Then you want this one to be uh, either zero or negative. Uh, well, suppose I just talk about this particular channel. Huh? I just talk about this particular channel. This uh, S channel double box contribution. You could also have a T channel. Then you have uh, just uh, just opposite way. You could have some of this kind of alpha things to be negative. No, but this I mean, after the reduction, you might have also this. You, your claim is that you don't have uh, numerators. Or what? Uh, when you reduce this. Uh, you, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. It should be. It should be. Yeah, it should be. You're right. I think you're right. Yes. Yes, because after reduction, you could have something that denominator becomes. Okay. Alpha 8 is this one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Good. Yes, could I be any. So actually, so it seems that you have an infinite number of uh, the integrals. But uh, in real life, you don't have so many, OK? Because uh, you need to consider like a renormalization condition, OK? So some thing will not appear in the yang theory. So even you consider super gravity, Einstein gravity, even then still, uh, the power cannot be very, very huge integer. Okay. So, but still, okay, uh, you have a lot of integrals to consider. But uh, you can say that after the integration by parse identity, there are eight, only eight integrals left. Okay, so we shall.
Okay, so you have uh, seven diagrams, and this particular diagram has two mass integrals. So one is uh, one the numerator just one, the other one is the numerator is uh, uh, this uh, d8. Yeah, so although this one could have maybe thousands of integrals, but eventually by the integration by parts identities, you can reduce the whole thing to only eight integrations. Then uh, you can somehow evaluate this kind of uh, integrals one by one, or you try to consider the differential equations for these eight integrals. But otherwise, it doesn't work if you really try to calculate uh, thousands of integrals. That's a uh, very, very bad situation. So this kind of uh, IBP reduction actually is crucial for the well, for the study of uh, like the perturbative QCD for a higher order, okay, and also for other kind of uh, gauge theory study for the uh, high loop order. But uh, this one actually, in some sense, is a bottleneck of the modern perturbative gauge theory. So the problem is, uh, okay, so how do you get this kind of uh, identities? So given this expression, you may think that This is an IPV identity. So, um, so here, this thing is a total derivative. So suppose there is no surface term, then this one is integrated to zero. But the thing is, uh, for the for the high loop level, this kind of thing, okay, uh, this v may not be a constant. You 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 need to assume this one is also a function of this l. Then you have a lot of possibilities. Then you could have a, probably a huge number of IBPs. Then uh, you have a linear system of a lot of relations. You need to do some kind of uh, Gaussian elimination, okay, find some way to really get the IBP you want. But this one is very, very time consuming, and in many cases, it's the most time consuming parts of computing uh, the multi loop amplitudes. Okay, so especially, okay, for this one it's okay, but especially something like uh, if you have five points, okay, then in this case you have uh, like uh, five minus 10 variables, or if you consider something like uh, four points with a lot of uh, massive particles inside, and if you try to get some kind of symbolic relations, then this kind of computation is extremely slow. Okay, about okay some uh, thinking of the IBP identities. So let's go back to the historic development. So this kind of IBP identities was first suggested by. Physicist. In 1980s, okay, for the study of uh, uh, Feynman integrals, okay, so that one was known for quite quite a long time. It's also a, a historic and a classic development using the IBP identities to reduce the number of integrals you could have for one process, okay. So after that, uh, there are some algorithms because, uh, of course, here you get a huge number uh, of identities. The question is, uh, how do you pick up the mass integral? Then in which direction you should do the reduction? Okay. So basically, you need some kind of definitions. So what is the ordering of the integrals? What kind of integrals to be removed? What kind of integrals can be chosen as mass integral? Uh, then uh, comes from this uh, Laporta algorithm so from 1990s 
Okay. The, uh, nowadays, there are several uh, public programs you can try. One is uh, by Smirnov and Smirnov. Yeah, and also the the pro program by by Roman here is a nice program called the Light Red, and also there's a program. some program you can try. Um, but uh, in general, I would say that still it's a, a quite open question. Okay, either for the application, because for some like five-point process, it may take a very, very long time to finish, and, uh, and you also need a lot of computer resources. So for example, the, I think uh, if you try to run it, uh, then maybe the biggest bottleneck is the memory usage. Okay, then probably don't want to run it with your local computer. You will try some kind of powerful cluster with a lot of memory. Uh, also, I have to say that uh, this IBP itself, this kind of integral reduction itself, is uh, uh, quite, quite interesting from a formal aspects, okay, especially from mathematical aspects. I try to understand uh, okay, deeply. So how does uh, this kind of uh, uh, IPP relations and the integral reduction relates to some kind of algebra. So for example, is that related to commutative algebra or non-commutative algebra or algebra geometry or computational algebra geometry. So I think uh, mathematically it's also quite interesting. So recent years, okay, about from about two years ago, I turned to this field and I tried to understand this kind of IPPs. Okay, in my viewpoint, so I will talk about uh, some recent progress I gave. Oh, yes. Yes. They claim that it's very fast. Well, the thing is, uh, the thing is, uh, the, of course, the difficulty is coming from you have to do a lot of uh, symbolic computation. Okay, in, yeah, in linear algebra. But of course, you can. The thing is, yeah, that's a there is even, I think, a, a name, like FinRed or something. Okay. Yeah, the thing is, uh, if you have a lot of... Uh, huh? Yeah. Not the field or the So, okay, so let's talk about 
um, change this form of the integration. Okay, so here you can see each of the d is some kind of quadratic function of L. Okay, uh, although there's just some quadratic function, but still it's some kind of uh, function there. Okay, and you have uh, a large number of d's. So one of the goal is uh, combine all this kind of d's together as one function. Okay, and another thing is uh, uh, you try to get rid of this kind of uh, d-dimensional L here because the d is something not fixed. Okay, and you don't want to consider this kind of L component by component. You want to treat it, uh, okay, in a dimensional independent way. Okay, so that's uh, something you can try. Try to get rid of the dimension explicitly and also try to combine all this kind of function together and you think of this kind of reduction. So one way to do that is, of course, this kind of Feynman parameterization. Uh, the goal is to combine all these kind of things together. Okay, and the, go the thing is you have to introduce the Feynman parameter, ZK for each of them. So after doing that, all the denominators are combined together. Okay, it's a textbook example. And uh, then, okay, since they are combined together, uh, then you can do the integration over this L quite, quite easily. But then the difficulty comes from, okay, you have to consider the integration over this. Then you transfer to another form of the thing. So I just write down the results of the Feynman uh, parametric representation. The thing is uh, you will get some gamma function. Okay, so you will have the integration over the Feynman uh, parameters. Okay, so uh, basically after you combine all these kind of denominators, you have this kind of L integration, that one is trivial, but it will give you some overall factors, some gamma functions, and also uh, actually this kind of coefficients of the L will give you two polynomials. So these are, suppose you say the sum over zi di, that's uh, Feynman parameterization is uh, <laughs> okay yeah. suppose everything is a quadratic it combines the uh, Denominates, you have something like this. Okay, then uh, this matrix, this kind of vector, and this kind of constant will all somehow contribute to some overall factor of the L integration. And uh, this uh, U is just uh, the determinant of A, and this F is. Uh, the euro Feynman parameterization. So if you have some one-loop case, actually it's quite, quite simple because uh, if you consider one-loop case, 
this thing is uh, this uh, it's just a sum over the zi's but uh, because of delta function this one is uh, dropped out it's built just a constant uh, one here but uh, if you consider two loop or higher loop level okay this uh, uh, Feynman parameterization is getting more complicated because uh, you will have two independent polynomials so in this case you can use a trick to get rid of these two polynomials, so the thing is, uh, you can consider some kind of a beta function uh, identities to combine these two things together. The result is uh, you will have a different kinds of Feynman parameterization. So the cost is uh, in the standard Feynman parameterization, you have the integration from 0 to 1. But here, this z is not the original z. It's uh, like uh, a rescaled z. The integration is from 0 to infinity. Okay, but the good thing is uh, this f and u, they are combined together. Okay. Uh, to my understanding, actually, if you look at it carefully, uh, this f and u actually they have two different kind of units. Okay, if you say the dimension of the mass, they have two different units. So I would say that uh, physically, this sum uh, is uh, not meaningful, but uh, this identity is correct because uh, both and f and u, okay, they are homogeneous polynomials, so you can consider some kind of a beta function identity. After this kind of integration, you get this kind of thing back. But the cheat itself is not physical, that's my understanding. Okay, so uh, you can see that uh, this complicated integration, okay, now you somehow, you remove this kind of d because uh, now this d only appears uh, here, okay, so I forget about this kind of oral, um, this oral factor that only appears here. So no matter what the dimension you have, this uh, folds of the integration, that's uh, fixed. Okay, so that's the advantage of that. And you only have one object, this G polynomial. Um, of course, okay, if you have a very complicated diagram, this G polynomial can be something quite complicated, but that's a different thing. Uh, you may consider, for example, symmetry and also IPPs in this representation. So previously I say, you consider the total derivatives in L, but you can also consider total derivative in Z here. Okay, then you will get uh, some kind of integration by parts identity. But uh, uh, one subtlety is uh, this integration is not from minus infinity to plus infinity, okay, it's from zero. So in general, you need to consider uh, actually the surface term as a zero. But in this case, it's not uh, something that complicated, I would guess, because uh, you just put in zero uh, into some total derivatives. The thing is uh, equivalent to say, okay, I consider some kind of lower topologies, because when z equals zero, then um, basically this uh, just by fem parameterization is propagated, is dropped. So you will get some surface term which has some lower um, topology integrals. That's a one way of uh, doing uh, this uh, Feynman integration. Of course, you can really do some computation. Suppose this integration is uh, is not that complicated, then you can boot the force, it's just integrate all the results. So uh, in this representation, you see the feature is, uh, <laughs> of course, this, if when this alpha i, okay, I have to say this alpha i should be okay, bigger or equal than one here. If you consider the case uh, alpha i, which is uh, less than one, you cannot just simply do something like this. You have to replace OK, 
you have to change this uh, integration to the derivative in the limit r equals to zero here. Okay, so uh, somehow I have to say that in this month, is in this representation, uh, if you have some integration with quite quite positive integer, actually it's very simple. But if you have something with negative integer, then you need to do some expansion. Suppose this power, well, third derivative, fourth derivative, then you have to do this kind of high order derivative, so you get expansion. Okay, so this one is uh, quite quite simple. For the uh, Feynman diagram with a lot of propagates, okay, but uh, on the other way around, you will get uh, the, some expansion. So there are some dual representation, okay, which will make uh, the the case where alpha i, okay, less than one, quite uh, simple. That is so-called Bikov representation. From 1994, isn't it? Uh, even early. Okay, so this one is uh, relatively new. So that one we are quite familiar because the class book, this kind of class, uh, textbook example, we just combine the denominators together. So eventually we get some kind of integration over Feynman parameters and also something with this uh, kernel uh, coming from the kinematics. So, uh, back of this one, okay, since probably you are not so familiar with it, so I just uh, do one example for you, and uh, you can see actually it's generally true for any number of loops. Again, let's consider the double box diagram with L1, L2. We have seven propagates. It's the denominates from the uh, Feynman propagates. We also have the numerator, which are okay, something like this. So here, okay, uh, for the bank of representation, the goal is not to uh, directly combine the denominator together, but uh, to linearize the denominator. So this, the way to do that is, uh, you can say, This one is a three-dimensional linear space because of uh, energy momentum conservation. So let's define this space as V3. Let's decompose L1 as uh, L1 is 3, that's a projection in the V, and also in the orthogonal okay, complement. Suppose I call it uh, L1 perpendicular. And also do something like uh, okay. Maybe you should skip some technical details. Okay. Sorry, I'm too slow on this. Okay. Anyway, so after this kind of uh, derivation, the I just give you the final result, which is uh, there are some kind of, uh, again, some gamma functions in front. But you will have the integration. So this is a, a bike of representation. So 
So the okay. So what do you get is uh, the good thing is uh, all the Ds. Uh, so previously there are some quadratic functions, okay. But then uh, trivial things are just uh, free, uh, free and uh, variables. So we can call it uh, z1 to z9. Actually, z i is dr. So basically, you pass to the denominators and integrate over. Yes, other variables. So you you get rid of this explicit d dependence. You you have a fixed number of variables. These things, this uh, uh, scalar products and linear rise the denominates. Okay, so there's a back of representation. So why uh, why do you think this one is useful? So uh, of course, okay. One thing is it will make uh, the unitarity cast simple. So, if you consider maximum cut, for example, maximum cut, that just means you take the residue at uh, the multi residue. Okay, and in this case, you just uh, do a Tyler expansion over this integrand here. Okay, then you can study the. Uh, this kind of maximum cut information, you can also do some long maximum cut. So, uh, why do you think this kind of thing is useful? Because uh, either you can consider using this kind of uh, way, okay, to do the unitarity, to glue this uh, tree amplitude into loop amplitudes. And also, uh, you can use the maximum cut to get some partial reduction uh, information, okay. So, you can derive some parts of the IBP identities, okay. Uh, other things why this one is quite useful is uh, it will make uh, all the integrand reduction totally trivial because uh, then whatever concentration downstairs or upstairs don't need any kind of tricky consideration. It's just uh, we can mathematically simplify that. Okay, it's all trivial. Okay, you don't need to combine how to combine this kind of D together. So it's a bike of representation. So in some sense, it's a duality of the Feynman parameterization. Now, of course, the complicated thing is you have F. So this one is a bike of polynomial. Okay, so. This one is just a polynomial, but it's raised to some power of d, so that's a complicated function. And the integration reaching should be f bigger or equal than zero. So the integration reaching is very complicated. Okay, if you try to draw it in multi uh, variables, it looks uh, quite quite complicated. Uh, but the good thing is, if you consider IPPs, uh, maybe it's a good uh, feature. Uh, the boundary of this integration reaching actually is f goes to zero. Well, f goes to zero, you can assume this part is vanishing. So in this argument, you can assume that uh, in back of representation, if you do the total derivative in this kind of this, uh, you don't have a surface term. Okay, that's one good thing. Okay. Although this integration region is extremely complicated. Okay. Now, let's do some of this kind of reductions. So suppose no matter what kind of uh, uh, no matter what kind of representation we have, we only have one polynomial left. This is a G polynomial or this F polynomial, back of polynomial. Okay, so uh, of course we can consider the IBP in general, but I just uh, go through a time model, okay, because I don't have enough time. Let's consider the double box with uh, a maximum cut. Suppose we use a back of representation and maximum cut. You will in general get some integrals like this. So this z1 to z7, they are gone because you take the residue. So we just talk about partial, this kind of partial reduction. So in this case, you will write some IPPs, probably look like uh, This f is a polynomial. 
Sorry? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, you have something from the... Yeah, Molon Mios, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's a generic uh, uh, IPP you can have. This A, this A, eight and A nine. Okay, so they are not just a constant. They could be also be some function of uh, the this. Okay. So if you're naive to this kind of uh, integral reduction, or of course you can put different kinds of functions here, get a lot of relations. But uh, uh, there's a general problem because uh, if you take the derivative, you have something like. Uh, Take the derivative over this uh, kernel f. Okay, you will get uh, the thing is You will, yeah, you will get a term like this. So this term is not wrong, but it's not convenient because uh, the power is changing. Okay, the power is changing. So, so besides, you get some reduction relations between the integrals. You are also getting some relations between integrals in different uh, space-time dimension. Okay, it's not wrong, but not so convenient. You have to somehow convert it back. So the way to convert it back, one of the way is, uh, uh, of course, this way is uh, just the one of the way. I don't mean that's uh, always the best way. Is so called. Okay, just okay, just a sensory condition. You assume. Okay, these two polynomials, okay, of this, they are not arbitrary, but they set the file something, okay, dot product with the first derivatives, get okay, something proportional to f. Okay, uh, all you can say, I put a. But proportional means the coefficient. It's a polynomial, it's a polynomial, otherwise it's always proportional to it, yes. Okay, so that is all polynomial. So if, if I say I know this f from my uh, back of representation, I try to solve uh, a8, a9, and b, okay? So it looks like a trivial linear algebra question. But when I restrict uh, my solutions to be polynomial, because I don't want to introduce new poles in the integrand, okay, then I will change the class of integrals. And this one is a long trivial equation for the synthetic equation, okay? <laughs> So, uh, since the equation just means uh, given these three known polynomials, you try to find uh, some kind of coefficient, some kind of uh, uh, polynomials, you find the total dot product is zero. Or that means uh, these three equations are actually they are not independent. They have some relations like this. It's called synthetic uh, equations. So, this kind of object is something we all uh, studied in mathematics, okay, from the times of Herbert. So, uh, of course, there's some algorithm to solve it, but uh, I think it's more interesting to talk about uh, some mathematical insights of this kind of equation. Let's uh, look at the synthetic equation in a little bit detail. So if I say I have uh, k polynomials, I try to solve for the synthetic equation for uh, for this ace. 
I can see that each of the AI should be in the polynomial ring. Okay, then of course, okay, you have a lot of trivial solutions if you say. Five minutes is okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So I would say, okay, you could have some kind of uh, trivial solution. So this kind of solution is called the Prince in Passages. So that's something I easily write down because it's anti-symmetric. You solve that. But uh, in general, you have more solutions, uh, okay, rather than this kind of uh, trivial solutions. So the theorem tells you that if you find that uh, if Particular, okay, if we go back to that case, if you find that uh, if uh, this combined equation has no solution, okay, then the synthetic equation is solved, okay, you only have a trivial. So, uh, but uh, unfortunately, okay, in some cases it's uh, true, but in general it's not true. Okay, so uh, I can give you some examples. Suppose f equals a very simple function. This one defines a circle. Then this is uh, true, okay? If you have something more complicated, uh, <laughs> Oh, sorry, let me, let me finish. No solution, yes, no solution. This condition is true. So this one is also true. So if you have a, uh, have a look of the picture, this one is a circle. This one is a elliptic curve. You can still try to draw it. So you will get something like this. Okay. As a no, this combined equation, no solution. Okay, then tri only trivial since you can solve your reduction problem. But sometimes when f equals Okay, you have something like this. This one is not an elliptic curve because this one has a cusp point. It's a very bad point. So, uh, in this case, so if you solve that, it has a solution. The solution is just this cusp point. So, uh, in general, okay, given any kind of a polynomial, even you have more than two variables, okay, general polynomial, this kind of combined equation tell you, so this one, this is a singular point. The solution is a, a so-called singular point of the variety. So that means if you have one, two, or any okay, positive number of singular points, then this kind of trivial synthesis solutions are not enough, you need more synthesis. Okay, so in this case, you need more synthesis. That synthesis is uh, just uh, some conformal transformation at that point. Okay, so that's a geometric way to understand uh, so how difficult the reduction is. So that means, uh, actually, in some sense, okay, if you don't worry about uh, how slow the symbolic computation is, uh, if you say, if you have something very massive diagram, uh, like this, if you have a massive double box, let's put everything massive. Okay, then this bike of polynomial on the maximum cut will get an elliptic curve, but this one is a complicated curve, but a smooth curve. So in this case, if you try to find this kind of ace from a synthetic approach, then you are lucky. 
you don't need to worry about any kind of computational algorithm. You just write down these trivial synthesis, that's enough. But if you have something like this, okay, then this F curve is a quite bad curve. It looks like this. Okay, it's not just a one curve, it's a reducible curve. Then you have three bad points. So in in that sense, okay, you can still use the trivial synthesis, but uh, you are yes, you combine together f equals zero. Yes, let's factorize into three of them. So in that case, you can still use the trivial solutions. Okay, but uh, always remember you are missing some uh, IBPs. Actually, you are going to miss three IBPs. Okay, so, but uh, that means that even this one physically is more complicated, but the synthesis structure actually is completely trivial. This one is. Uh, uh, much less trivial. Okay, so in general, you don't need to worry about the geometric picture. Okay, you just uh, run some program. There are some algebraic way to get it. Like you run Sage or Singular or Magai two to get uh, all the generators of the synthesis set. But uh, keep in mind, okay, the how difficult that one is. All coming from this kind of uh, geometric picture. So this is for the maximum cut. You can also do some similar thing for the non-maximum cut. Okay, you can do something like a triple cut, not this kind of seven-fold cut. Okay, then by considering all these kind of cuts, you will get a, eventually get a complete IBPs. Okay, so I always try to avoid uh, this kind of uh, IBP in all the variables. That definitely something slow. I always consider parts by parts. Each time you consider some kind of uh, utility cuts, I get a, a part of the IBP, and then I combine this kind of thing together. So uh, we try to somehow in implement this algorithm by the synthetic analysis and the different kinds of utility cuts. So so far, okay, for this kind of simple example, it's uh, really fast. Okay, if you consider this double box to complete to a sunset level, okay, to this. Uh, Double bubble it only takes about 40 seconds on laptop. Even you don't need uh, a lot of memory, or you, you don't need a parallelized uh, computation. If you consider something like uh, with one massive leg, it's still quite good. It can be finished uh, in less than three minutes. But these are uh, quite simple examples. I uh, suppose I give you some generic uh, diagram. You say I have a double box. I consider the numerator with a scalar, linear, and also quadratic up to, for example, to some rank like rank four. Okay, I consider all these kind of targets. I combine them and reduce everything to the eight mass integral, which was uh, here. So the whole thing takes about forty minutes, uh, forty seconds, forty seconds on your laptop. If you have a one. One massive here, then still on your laptop is less than three minutes. So for this kind of four, uh, four point examples, actually it looks very fast. And another advantage is if you have simple topology like a uh, double box like this, but you have a very high rank, like rank eight, if you consider super gravity, then it uh, looks very good. In that sense, it uh, looks better than file because uh, uh, better you than file? yeah better better than file. Okay, now if you consider rank eight, it's better than file. So uh, I know UCLA group is using this algorithm for their computation with this kind of uh, long maximum supersymmetric uh, gravity amplitudes for two loop. Okay, mm. but uh, in general, if you have more massive scales or if you have five point, it's uh, not so good so far because if you try to get synthesis itself. Uh, with uh, some program that like singular Macaulay to is slow. So we are trying to somehow rewrite our own program optimized for symbolic input. I'll try to do something like the finite numbers, do everything with finite numbers, and do a lot of experiments and try to fit in this kind of IBP. That's something we are trying right now. So I'm sorry, I, I think I already took a lot of time, and that's the end of my talk. And thanks for your patience, and thanks for your listening. Yes. This is uh, sort of. But uh, the thing is, if uh, this one contains some massive propagates, uh, in general, you know there should be some singular points. Yeah. Unless you have something extremely massive, everything has a mass scale in this. Then, and in this case, you know it should be elliptic. And but uh, in some sense, this uh, synthetic structure is simple. Okay. So your point.
understand that the scissors just can, uh, can really help for this tool, for example. Because because it, that's the thing is, uh, I, what I heard from UCL group is uh, if you really have something like a simple topology but a lot of very huge rank, then actually file seems that uh, takes uh, quite a while to finish. Okay, but in this approach, it seems that everything can be simply uh, constructed from uh, uh, from this kind of uh, synthesis generators. Okay, so uh, roughly speaking, okay, if you consider rank eight, then you need to consider the original approach. You need to put something <coughs> quite high rank here. You need to do a lot of tests or linear reduction. But uh, synthesis itself already has some power. Okay, it could have power three or something. In that sense, uh, you need to multiply the synthesis generator by another polynomial, but definitely not some polynomial with uh, degree eight or degree seven, just lower ones. So that in that sense, for Simple topology and uh, uh, higher rank actually, this is better than five, but that's just uh, not so many applications so far. Okay. So, thanks again.